So we, the first panelist is Kevin Arsenault. He's an associate professor of political science and a faculty affiliate with the Institute of Public Affairs and director of Behavioral Foundations Lab at Temple University. He studies political communication, political psychology, and political behavior. And his most recent book, Changing Minds or Changing Channels, Partisan News in an Age of Choice, employs novel experimental methods to investigate how human agency shapes the influence of political media. Slow down. What? <laughs> okay. Uh, Danny Hayes is an assistant professor of political science at George Washington University. Uh, his research focuses on political communication and political behavior in American politics. And his most recent book, he's co-author of Influence from Abroad, Foreign Voices, the Media, and U.S. Public Opinion. Gary Jacobson is a distinguished professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego. He um, specializes, we all know, in the study of U.S. elections, parties, interest groups, public opinion, and Congress. And he's the author of many, many books, uh, Money in Congressional Elections, The Politics of Congressional Elections, The Electoral, Connect, uh, the Electoral Origins of Divided Government, and co-author of Strategy and Choice in Congressional Elections. And, hold on, I'm flipping, Talia Stroud is Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Assistant Director of Research at the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life at the University of Texas at Austin. Her recent book, Niche News, The Politics of News Choice, received the International Communication Association's 2012 Outstanding Book Award. So obviously, if you hadn't figured it out yet, this panel is about media and polarization. Um, I should also note that we have four papers on this panel, and so I was told that we should really stick to 12 minutes. And although I don't sky score high in authoritarianism, I do score very high in bossiness. So I guarantee that every presentation will really only last for 12 minutes. Uh, and we will begin with Kevin. Um, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm going to go fast. Otherwise, Jen's going to uh, throw her shoes at me. Um, so let's, uh, let's go. So I don't have to really go this. Um, <laughs> we already covered that. We're polarized. Um, the, the question is uh, whether or not partisan news media have, have a role. And so um, the way in which um, I think, think about this is to think about the route through which the partisan media would, would um, polarize either elites or the mass public. So there could be a, a direct route. And um, so there's, there's work that suggests that actually politicians uh, watch the news um, and uh, form opinions about what they think the public thinks based on that. Um, of course, if people are exposed to partisan news media, we're talking about Fox News, MSNBC, um, radio, these sorts of things, um, there's lots of uh, work. Some people on, on this panel, in fact, showed that you know, exposure to, to either like-minded news shows or oppositional news shows can, both of those can actually uh, polarize. So then we get to the, that should be fairly straightforward. What about the indirect effects? So, um, well, the, the direct effect, the mass level, could have an indirect effect on, on elites. So the idea here would be that you watch uh, Fox News, you get really uh, teed off about Benghazi, and so then you call up your, your, um, your congressperson and say, you know, do something about this. Um, and your congressperson saying, you know, I don't want to get unelected, I'm going to go ahead and do what my constituents tell me to do when they call in. Um, and then finally, there can be indirect uh, ways in which uh, partisan news could affect the mass uh, public. And this, this is important because not that many people on a daily basis tune into partisan uh, shows on, on TV, a bit more on, on um, radio, but still there's some pretty decent evidence out there to suggest it's not, it's not a ton. Um, but nonetheless, you know, people talk to other people. And so these things could spread through their uh, discussant networks. And uh, so people don't necessarily have to be watching this stuff to, to get polarized by it. All right, so that's the setup. So now the question is, um, you know, can we, can we use that to sort of blame, I guess, if, if I can take a negative frame for polarization, uh, the partisan news media for polarization? Well, at, the, at the elite level, it, it doesn't appear to be much the case. So if we just use Fox News, um, Fox News was the, the first partisan news network on television to enter the market. We could also talk about cable, uh, I'm sorry, um, radio news, uh, which started a little bit earlier, but not much earlier. Uh, they were both to the right. And the, the thing about this graph is it suggests that polarization began a little earlier among elites. And you know, uh, John, I think John Ladd is in the, in the audience um, back there. He might, he might suggest that, that we could actually spin an argument the other way, that, that 
we have partisan media because elites are, are polarized. Um, so the timing doesn't quite work for elites. The other thing is, this is some work that uh, I've done with uh, those co-authors down there. Um, so Fox News, it actually entered the districts. It, 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 it didn't just appear all at once across the country. It, it actually had sort of an uh, intermittent rollout in the, in the late 90s. And so there were some congressional districts in the, in the late 90s that had Fox News and some that didn't. Um, so what these graphs show is that um, the, the sort of x-axis is uh, um, across uh, the, the days before the election. Uh, and the, the y-axis is a probability of casting a party vote. And so we have this split out by Democrats and Republicans. And most of the time, what you see is during the, the session, there's not that much difference between um, members who have Fox News and members who do not have Fox News. The only time you see a divergence is when the election is getting close. That's kind of kind of what you would expect because this is when um, politicians start paying attention to strategic reasons to what they think that the, the mass public wants. And you know, if, if these are too difficult to read, basically what, what this shows is that um, Democrats and Fox News districts uh, are, are less likely to cast a party vote uh, as the election gets closer, whereas Republicans, it's the opposite. Those in Fox News districts are more likely to uh, cast uh, a, a party vote as the election approaches. That's another way of saying the effect of Fox News at this time was actually to get everybody to vote more Republican. So if anything, what this suggests is that Fox News might have actually kind of depolarized at the beginning. Um, all right, what about, what about the mass electorate? Well, on abortion, not so much. That actually started polarizing a little bit earlier. But on, on the rest of uh, sort of economic dimension, and the, this is the eff uh, effective dimension <coughs> for presidents that you guys were here earlier, you would know all about uh, this kind of polarization. There's a, it's a bit more su suggestive here. MSNBC shifts left, so we actually have a polarized, actually, uh, a, a, a polarized um, media landscape. Um, and what this suggests is that, um, yeah, maybe there's something to this. Um, Again, this is just a correlation, a suggestive one at that. So let's try to unpack it. Well, the first thing that we wanted to um, consider, and this is the basis of, of, of Martin and uh, my uh, book, is that you know the emergence of partisan news media doesn't occur in a vacuum. It actually uh, starts at a time when there's an explosion of, of other options on television in particular, uh, not to mention the internet and, and other things like that. And Really what this does is actually explodes the number of entertainment options that are available. So now, if you think back to the uh, 70s and 80s, a lot of people watch the news that probably didn't really want to. If they could change the channel and watch something else, they, they would have done that. And so in fact, there is evidence that that happens. So pretty much around this time, you see a, a sharp drop off in the percent of people who say that they uh, watch uh, a lot of, of news. This is watching news five days a week. Um, so if we use that as an indicator of um, whether or not someone's a news seeker, that is they watch news on, or say they, at least say they watch news on a regular basis, or entertainment seekers, those who say they, they do not, um, th some interesting things emerge. First off, on abortion, uh, again, abortion is one of those sort of hot button cultural issues. People seem to be polarized on that without uh, any help, um, at least from the, from, the, from the media. But we do see, um, in terms of effective polarization, in terms of a polarization on economic issues, that there is more of a divergence between those who watch news and those who do not watch news after we have the introduction of partisan news media. So you might say, aha, that we've got our culprit, right? Well, there's a couple things. First, this measure doesn't isolate partisan news exposure. It's a standard like na national election studies question, you know, do you watch, did you watch the news? It could be a lot of things. Um, the other thing is, well, let's be, uh, let's step back for a second and, and, and recognize that this pattern could also reflect sel selection bias. So we have a lot more entertainment options. People are selecting into news. People certainly select into partisan news. So what we could see going on right here is now that people have choice in their media, you know, on, on what they consume, that those who select into news audiences are already just more polarized. Okay, so we need to sort this out. Being an experimentalist, I'm going to use an experiment. Um, nice thing about experiments is random assignment at least allows us to have uh, at least construct a counterfactual and have something to compare. Something to compare. Um, this is something called a participant pre preference experiment. I won't go into it a whole lot, but basically what you do is you, you measure before you apply the treatment what people would prefer, whether they want news, partisan news, otherwise, or whether they prefer entertainment. 
Then you expose them to a treatment group or a control group, and you measure the effects of that treatment or control group on a, with a post-test instrument. All right, so this is some work that Martin and I um, will be presenting at uh, APSA, hopefully with some more data to go along with it. So uh, I hope I didn't uh, ruin it with a spoiler. Um, but what, what, so let me, I guess I should say a couple things. Um, so what is the, the, the y-axis here is um, uh, larger, the more positive numbers mean that exposure to the news treatments uh, polarized. Um, and so what are the treatments? Well, people could be exposed to a, a mainstream news, so like the, I think actually the CBS uh, nightly news. They could be exposed to a pro-attitudinal news show, that would be a, a conservative watching Fox, a liberal watching MS, MSNBC, or counter-attitudinal news show, which is a very fancy way of saying the opposite of that, a conservative watching MSNBC, for instance. Now, um, these are all compared to the baseline, which is people who were controlled to, uh, assigned at random to a control group, so these people just watch some entertainment show. Um, all right, so what do we see? We see a couple things uh, that comes out of this. The first is that uh, partisan news uh, shows have a stronger effect on entertainment seekers, so people on the, on the uh, far right. So these are the people on the pretest who said they would prefer to watch the entertainment show if given a choice. We then didn't give them a choice. We either made them watch a news show or not. And so what you see there is that if you assign them to a partisan news show, it's, they're the ones who are more likely to be polarized than the people who told you that they prefer to watch partisan news, or even those who, who said they would prefer to watch a mainstream news show. Um, the other thing that you get out of this that I think is really interesting is that the mainstream news can polarize as well. So, uh, and this is true among partisan news seekers and, um, and entertainment news seekers. So what that means is people who watch the mainstream news show, which I haven't obviously described a lot because I only have 12 minutes, uh, basically like any mainstream news show, today this happened in Congress, the Democrats said this, the Republicans said that, give you e e equal time to both sides. Um, this is supposed to, this is balanced, right? This is supposed to be um, the you know, journalistic standard by which we live by. Now what that suggests is that that standard can also potentially polarize people. They can figure out what their side believes and then pick that side. Um, so we want to take this very seriously. Um, and we want to pit together the notion that you know, what's doing the polarizing when you expose people to, to news, partisan news or otherwise. One possibility is that it's about the ideological content. And a lot of the research in this area, ours included, has sort of assumed that implicitly. That's what really matters. But the other possibility um, is it could, be, it could be partisan cues. And, and uh, my um, uh, apologies to, to Hans Manal, who's in the room. Um, but the idea is that, you know what, the media does another thing besides telling you the reasons for supporting policy. They tell you what the party elites stand, where they stand on the issues, and whether or not they're polarized on it as well. Um, so there's some work by Jimmy Druckmann that suggests that you can actually get people to depolarize on issues if you tell them that the party elites aren't actually polarized on it. All right, so let's try to sort this out um, with a participant preference experiment. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little different. We're going to provide people with counter-stereotypical cues, which is a really you know, highfalutin way of saying, tell them have a party elite or a uh, news, um, uh, someone from their like-minded news network, take a position on an issue that is contrary to what their ideological position would be. Um, and we're going to vary the source here. It's going to either be a, a like-minded news uh, person or a co-partisan, somebody from their party. Um, and then here are the issues on which, on which we worked um, on. We've got, um, we tried to pick a, a number of these. Some would be kind of hot button issues like gun control, the death penalty, some that are a little bit more recondite like uh, bank regulation and then uh, sort of federalism issues. And you know, just to give you an idea, I'll, I'll, I'll take the gun control one. Um, so liberals were assigned to a position where you know, either somebody from MSNBC or a Democratic uh, party elite basically made a case for, you know, we should have waiting period, um, um, that waiting periods and registries really won't stop criminals. And so, you know, the sort of standard NRA kind of argument, actually. Conservatives saw the opposite. You know, waiting periods and registries actually help law enforcement. So maybe we should have those. Um, so if, if this is really about ideology, people should just be able to reject that. It doesn't matter the source that it's coming from. All right, so, so what do we find? Well. The y-axis here measures the level of polarization. So that's, what, that's um, liberals and conservatives in the sample taking more extreme positions. What 
what this shows is across all the issues, maybe with a little exception of, of the death penalty where people, people's opinions seem to be a little more crystallized, that by simply seeing a party a elite, whether that be a media elite or be a party, uh, somebody in their political party apparatus, take a position that is counter stereotypical, actually causes people to move more towards the center on these issues. So what we're seeing right here is that elites can actually take positions on these issues that depolarize, um, including things like gun control um, and all the way up to things like you know, federalism that are supposed to be central to our political debate. Right? If we sort this out by, uh, by news preference, we, we see the same effects. In fact, we see the people who say they would prefer to watch partisan news, they're actually more polarized than everybody in the control group, kind of as you would expect. That's why they watch partisan news. But when you give them a, part, a, a partisan source, they look just like everybody else. They actually move a little further, um, which we thought was kind of interesting. Um, so some concluding thoughts on this, and hopefully I'm. You're over by the second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're right. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'll just leave it at this. So, so VO Key is very much our, our sort of touchstone here. I, every time I read VO Key's work, I always think that we've kind of wasted our time the past six years. <laughs> but this, you know, what goes in the echo chamber uh, kind of affects what comes out of the echo chamber. And so partisan elites pay, can play a really major role in terms of polarizing or depolarizing the electorate.